Thank you. So my, my uh, profession is kind of rare. I actually don't know anybody else who claimed to be a full-time inventor, that this is what they do for a living. And it is somewhat of a problem. And the reason is that when people ask me what I do, and I reply that I'm an inventor, they think that I'm inventing the reply. They, they don't really believe me. So often I would say that I'm working in computers or doing something. But, but I am a real-time inventor, and I a uh, full-time inventor, and I'll talk about my inventions. So usually when I talk about inventions, I would talk about inventions that are of interest to the audience that I talk to. And in this audience, it would have been natural to talk about inventions that are related to uh, software engineering or to testing. But as we are going to have a wider audience over the internet, uh, I'll be talking about general inventions. So when I talk about general inventions, I gave in talks about all sorts of topics. I gave talks about inventions that were related to blind people when I was talking to the right audience. I gave talks about inventions and all of those are mine, inventions that are related to psychology when I was giving a talk at my daughter's uh, 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 university. I uh, gave a talk about uh, augmented reality, to, uh, inventions related to inven augmented reality, inventions related to dancing. Um, 12 years ago, <coughs> I was, no, sorry, 20 years ago actually, I, was, uh, I became an IBM master inventor and I was asked to give a talk related to becoming a master inventor and asked them what should my talk be about. And they said, well, you're the master inventor. You decide what your talk is about. So I gave a talk which was about what kind of patents you can brag about to other inventors. Um, this time I will talk about uh, patents that are uh, related to sight. And, um, and I chose a number of topics here. So the first one is related to uh, technology that I invented for helping blind people. And I explain how how this came about. The second topic is related to uh, patterns that are related to the fact that I can observe your eye as you are doing things. And I'll explain how, what kind of things can you do with observing somebody's eye. And, and currently it's not all that popular. People do eye tracking to see whether they're watching the, the laptop, but it will become a lot more popular. And the reason it will become a lot more popular is because of augmented reality. So everybody is thinking that augmented reality is going to be the next smartphone. It will be on here. And one of the things that it will need to do is know where you're looking. So it will give you the right impression. And then I will, uh, I will finish by talking about two patterns for other senses, one related to smelling and one related to sound. So I'll start a little bit about talking about, about myself. Um, so I did my uh, master's uh, here in, uh, in Haifa in the Technion. And I did my PhD uh, in Carnegie Mellon. Um, and one of my uh, advisors was Herb Simon, who, who is sort of special because he has both the Turing Award and uh, the Nobel Prize, and also the von Neumann Award and some other things. Um, when I came back to Israel, I uh, moved to IBM. And uh, after a while, uh, I became an IBM master inventor. And the master inventor in IBM, the job was in addition to my patents at the time, I had 70 patents of my own. Um, I would help other people invent. So people would come to me with ideas, either from IBM Haifa or from IBM in the world, anywhere related to software engineering. And I would make, help them make the ideas that they had a better idea. And at the time, I was sort of uh, different than most other inventors in IBM. Uh, IBM does have quite a few master inventors. In the sense that uh, I didn't invent mainly in my topic. I invented about half in my topic, which was software engineering, and half in totally random fields. So I had many patterns that were not related in any way to, uh, to my field of work. Um, so I uh, quit IBM in 2010. And the question is, what will I do next? And it was not clear. One option was to become a um, to become a professor in university. But this didn't fit my lifestyle. I live in the Galilee and, and, uh, and the options were in, in either the south of the country or in Switzerland. Um, so somebody says, why don't you become an inventor? And I said, but, but what does that mean? And then he, he pointed me to a company and this company actually uh, bought uh, 10 of my ideas before I invented them. 
So I figured, well, it shows that you can actually make a living as an inventor, so let's try to, to be a full-time inventor. And then, um, and then people came to me and said, please invent something for us. And this was either startups in Israel or, or, or bigger companies. So my main work is that I, people come to me or I come to them and uh, I go to a company and I invent for them whatever they need inventing in computer science. And in the last uh, five years, I probably invented about 100, filed 100 patents for different companies in different fields of computer science. Uh, I sold about 60 ideas, and in this talk I will show you an example of what it means to sell an idea and what it is. It's not a patent. I just tell somebody about an idea, and he buys the idea. It's, it's not as much money as a patent, but it's about a, week, a monthly salary for an idea. I consult people on uh, patent strategies, and I sometimes people come to me and ask for an idea for which will be a startup later. So this example here called ViaVision, is a startup that started based on a, on a patent of mine. And, and it seems, to people who are not from the field, it seems that it's totally unfair. Because somebody would come to you, and eventually there'll be a startup. In this case, the startup exists, and it, it raised more than $10 million. And, and I get my share, which is like, say, $10,000, and I don't have any percentage. But the person I did it with, he worked on it five years as a CEO, which all of you know that that's kind of a lot of work, and I worked on it for two days. So, so there is a difference. As an inventor, you just do the front part. I also teach about inventing, and I teach about inventing mostly based on my mistakes, not based on the things that I do correctly. So you learn not to make mistakes. My first invention was the most uh, valuable one. I invented... Uh, a way to print invisibly, and that's related to sight. So it turns out that if you have something that size and you fill it with, uh, with points, you, you make it black on a, on a printed page, this is about half a million dots that, that were printed by your printer. If you put a cloud of a thousand dots there, just a thousand, a cloud and the dots are not next to each other, like you can see in the picture, the yellow dots there, it's basically invisible. It's not fully invisible, but it's fairly invisible, and you can write any information that you want, such as, for example, the name of the printer, the anything, who printed it, and whatever it is. And the reason it became so valuable is that uh, the US government asked all the print companies to do it on all the printers. So when you print something now, your printer spies on you. But not only does it spies on you, it uses exactly the same way to do it as written in my patent, so it's obvious that this is the way to do it. It took me a while to find it out because, after all, it is invisible printing. Um, but we did find out, and they, uh, I, uh, <clears throat> I tried to make money out of it, but I made all sorts of mistakes based on the fact that it was uh, my first patent. So when I invented it, I was a PhD student. The university decided that it has no value. Um, and then, um, well, 15 years or 17 years later, I tried to make money. And as I said, uh, the entire printing industry is using it. The patent, not, not, not the industry, the patent itself is considered worth quite a lot of money had I known how to protect it. Um, I didn't at the time. So, um, so if you're an inventor, you're most likely to lose money. And, and there is an inherent reason to that. Um, it's really hard to do it correctly, but also um, mentally the problem is the following. So you're an inventor and you're not like me because you didn't sell 300 patents, you, you probably did a bit less. That's your patent and, and you're thinking, well, it's my idea, so it's worth probably a billion dollars, right? Because, it's, because I'm so smart. But you do know that in order to make money, you have to spend a little money to make it work. So you... Uh, you put a $10,000 into, you give to the lawyer to write the patent. And then you give somebody $10,000 to make a business plan. And then you give somebody $20,000 to make a prototype. So you are $40,000 down, which you're not going to make. So most people actually lose money and the US will, uh, will every two or three years come up with a campaign telling inventors, be careful, you're going to lose money. Most of the people actually uh, lose money there. 
Um, so I think inventors need to learn how, uh, how, to, do those things, uh, how to do those things well. Um, and I give a course. Um, actually, this is the first time I will announce it. I'm, I'm, in a month, I'll give a, a six-meeting course here in Haifa, which I do as a volunteering work for mainly for the Arab sector. But if people are interested in a Friday course, um, this will be the course. OK, so we talked about my background. And now we'll start talking about patents. And this story started when I left IBM. So I was a master inventor in IBM, which meant that unlike most people, any idea that I had would belong to IBM. So it's not just ideas in, in my field. They, they, and, and I had ideas in many fields. And when I left IBM, I decided I want to invent something that IBM cannot say in any way that it's related to IBM. So I set myself a task. This week, I'm going to invent something that is not related to my work in any way. So I figured I'm going to do it in one of my two hobbies. One of my hobbies is understanding Judaism. And I couldn't figure out anything that has to do with it that I could get a patent on. And the second hobby is that I like, I like dancing. So I figured, OK, so let's do a patent that is inspired by dancing. And then I thought, what is it that I know how to do as a dancer? So in dancing, uh, the kind of dance that I do, social dancing, tango, for example, you have two roles. You have the role of leading. And you have the role of following. And I do the role of leading, which means that even though I'm not such a great dancer, I can tell the follower where to put her legs uh, fairly accurately without using any force. If you use force, it means you're a really bad dancer. I'm not that bad. So I thought, OK, so why is this useful? And then I say, where do you need leading? And another place where you need leading is for blind people. And, and why do you need leading for blind people? Because they need to get from place to place. And there are two techniques to get a blind person from one place to the other. One of them is the cane. Basically, he learns about the environment. He goes like that. He figures out where he is and what to do. And the other one is the dog, which basically takes you there. And those, both techniques are 100 years old. And those dogs are extremely clever. I mean, like, really clever. For example, when they, before they become, before they're being trained, they, you want to test them for being clever. So one of the tests is the dog is in the kennel where, with the other dogs. And somebody would come and give treats to the dogs. But he would give treats only to the dogs that don't ask for it. So if a dog wants a treat, he has to observe what's going on and figure out that if he wants to get the treat, he has to stay quiet and not ask for it. Think about how many of your four-year-olds will be able to pass this test. OK, so those dogs are smart, but, but they're still dogs, which means that one of the things that they can't do is they don't know how to read a map. They can't use a GPS. And you can't tell them, take me to a specific place. You can tell them, take me to the supermarket, because they've been told where the supermarket is, or tell me to Chaim if I know Chaim. But you can't tell them, take me to Herzl 22, because they don't know how to read a map. So to solve this problem, um, the Japanese came up with this idea of a mechanical dog. So you have a mechanical dog, and the mechanical dog can read the map and can do all those things, and then you can follow it. Now, as an inventor, when you look at something, you don't ask why is this clever, you ask why is this stupid, because you want to find the next solution. And what's the problem with this idea? Why this idea makes no sense whatsoever for me? The problem is that, first, it's really expensive. And the second thing is that the blind person actually does know how to walk. You don't need, you don't need it to be told. You just need to give him instruction of how to walk. This is where dancing comes in. I know how to give instructions to people. So we did, uh, we did the dancing, we do the instruction on the belt based on, uh, based on the idea of tango that will uh, help you lead. As I was doing it, I was, seeing, I was thinking, one of the things that you do lead, it's really actually really easy to lead, is a large step. So you want, instead of a regular step, do a large step now. And I went to the place where they train dogs, and I said, you should teach the dogs to lead a large step. Why is it useful to read a large step? Because if we see something small on the floor, we go above it. We don't go around it. And with blind people, they teach them how to, how to go around it. But since they knew why I was there, they ignored me and said I was trying to teach the dog how to dance. But, uh, but I still think it would be the dogs would be easily able to learn that. OK, so, so I do have uh, quite a number of other, uh, other patterns on dancing, uh, some of it shows that I've been thinking on the wrong thing while I was dancing. Um, for example, uh, I have a patent on how to remotely dance with somebody. 
And this is difficult because when you dance, it's a tactile based uh, experience. So you dance and, and you dance with your eyes closed often, especially the followers. And the question is, how can you do it when you do it remotely? And quite a number of other patterns related to dancing. So now I'm going to pass into the second topic, which is patterns related to eye tracking. So just as a little bit of a background, if you look at the eye of somebody, it doesn't move uh, continuously. It, it jumps with a thing called cicada, and it moves from place to place. And when it gets to where it wants to be, then it will do many ones like that. And then when I left IBM, somebody came to me and says, I want to find, uh, people, uh, I want to find people who lie in airports. I want to find terrorists. And finding people who lie is a very difficult problem. Why is it a difficult problem? The first reason is that it's obvious. Lots of people are looking for liars. And the second reason is that people are really good at lying. So, so it's hard to find them. So somebody asks you a question, and what I do as an inventor, I don't do what he asks, I do what I can do. And what I said what I can do is I can find out if I show you a picture of somebody, if you know him or you don't know him. And how can I do that? So I've read research that said that if you look at the inside, if you, if you look at somebody that you know, you look more at most at the inside of the face. And if you look at somebody that you don't know, you look mostly at the outside of the face. And then I can show you a picture and see where, how you look. And from that, realize if you know. And from that, if I show you a picture, say somebody is from a, an organization that you don't like, I show him a picture from that organization. And if he knows him, it's suspicious and, and we go forward. So we opened the startup, we wrote a patent, he opened the startup. And there was only uh, a slight problem that we couldn't recreate this research. It just didn't work. And it turns out that easily more than 50% of the research that you read in psychology and biology is not possible to recreate. So you can't trust it. Actually, a lot more than that. But, but in 50, I will stay. It's changing now. But, but yeah, so, so, so there was a problem. There was a startup, and, and they had all this equipment, and people paid money, and just the idea didn't work. So I tried to figure out a different way to do the same thing. And then I came up with the following idea. So instead of showing you one picture, I'm showing you two pictures. And what I do is I'm asking you, is it the same person or not the same person? So, so there are four cases. And let's start with the case that you're not trying to lie. So if you know the person, you look at the right, you say, this is, uh, this is Marina. You look at the left, you say, this is not Marina. And you're done. So if I look at your eyes, you see that you go like that, and you're done. If you don't know the person, you jump like that, and you try to compare. So by looking at your eyes, if you're not lying, it's really easy to know, um, to know if you know the person or not. Let's assume that you are lying. There are still two cases. One of them is you don't know the person, and you say that you know. This case is not interesting, because I'll ask you who it is, and you don't know. So we have only one case which is interesting, which I'm trying to spot. Somebody knows the person. <laughs> But what he's doing is jumping like that to look as if he doesn't know the person. It turns out that you are not trained in controlling your eyes well enough. And we can tell easily the patterns between people who know the person and don't know the person when they jump. So this technique actually does work for knowing if, if you do know a person or not, don't know a person. Uh, I assume you recognize one of them. The second one you don't recognize in, in the pictures that you see. Uh, the second example. So one of the things that is becoming very common is, uh, is uh, remote learning. You take a course in Coursera or one of those classes, and, and you take it remotely. And then if you want to get a certificate that you took the course, you also get tested remotely. So how do I validate um, that you are the one who did the test? Because you're doing it at home. You can cheat. So what I do is I will, take the, I will take a camera, say the camera of your computer, it does make a difference, or, or put a camera there. And then I can see that it is you who's taking the test. So you're sitting there, but, but how do I know that you are thinking about the solution? It could be that somebody is there in your room, and, and, and he's telling you what to, what to write, or how to reply. How do I know that you're not cheating? So what MIT did, is that uh, they put a camera on your, you're supposed to put a camera on your top lobe, and it moves around and look around the room to see if there's somebody else there. But of course, it's your room. You could split the image, you could hide under the table. It's not going to work. So what I want to know is I want to know if you're the one 
thinking about the solution. Not if you're the one just writing, I want to know. Writing, yes, we checked. But how do I know that you're the one thinking about the solution? So what I do is the following. I track your eyes, because we're talking about eye tracking now, right? I track your eyes, and then I have a pattern of how your eyes moved. Now I take, say, 300 people who replied and they knew the solution, and I take 300 people who replied and didn't know the solution, and I look at their eye tracking data, and the question is, if I can classify them, so the people, I can tell them apart, then if you look at it and I, your eyes are like the people who actually answered it correctly, then I'm saying fine. If they are not, I don't know that you are cheating. It could be that your eyes are moving in a different way. So for example, there are people who have nystagmus, their eyes just jump randomly, and I don't know what they think. So what I do is I'm saying, if you, if, if you don't qualify as a person who I know that, that thought about the reply himself, then I will send it to somebody else. I, I will send you to be examined in a place where somebody watches you. Now, this is an example of a patent that I couldn't have filed 10 years ago. Because what does the patent say? The patent say, well, we do this, so I explain it, and then this magic of deep learning happens. I didn't specify the algorithm. I specified that I'm going to classify. This was just not possible 10 years ago to say, just do it. You'd have to specify how you do it. But now you can say, I classify it. So if you have deep learning, you can have patents that are using deep learning, and they're using it to say, now the magic happens. If it's an obvious thing that deep learning would do, like, like in this example, if it's an obvious thing that deep learning would do, then, then it's not a patent. For example, if you say, I give all the data about, uh, about, uh, about apartments, and then I want the deep learning to tell me how much the apartment would cost. That's sort of an obvious thing that deep learning would do, would classify. So that's not a patent. But if you use it in something in a way that is not obvious, you can now use deep learning in a different way. Yeah. The next thing is, uh, is a patent related to uh, dancing. So there is a situation in, uh, in tango that you are about to invite a partner for the dance. And the way to invite a partner for the dance is called cabaseo. And the way you do it is the women sit here, and I sit here, and there are men sitting, or whatever. And you try to catch eye contact with a woman. And if you catch eye contact with her, and you hold it for three seconds, then you go like that. And if she goes like that, then you invited her, and then you walk to her place. And as you walk, you walk like that. And the reason that you walk like that is because she might have been saying yes to somebody next to you. See, they're sitting three deep. So you don't know, and it's far away. So you walk to get to her. And if she continues to keep the eye contact, then you invite her. And if she doesn't continue to keep the eye contact, then you know she said yes, not to you. So as you get to here, you go to the toilet not to look like a... And, and this is the way to invite a person to dance. And as you can see, if you look at this picture, I took it in Buenos Aires two years ago. And what you can see is that nobody is even remotely looking in my direction, which means that I can't invite them. It's not that they cheat. I, I can't invite them. And the reason they're not looking in my direction is they put me in the place of the new people coming to, to town, and so everybody ignores us. OK, so now I explain something that I know. And this is a useful way to invent. You take something that you know and most other people don't know. And you ask, what technology can I make with Cabasel? How can I make money out of Cabasel? I'm probably the only person in the world who made money out of Cabasel. So, so remember, we talked about eye tracking, right? So I know where I'm looking. I know where somebody else is looking. So what I could do is, if I have a device, it knows where I'm looking, and the other device knows where this is looking, we can see that we are looking at each other. And then instead of inviting somebody to, to dance, I can do something else, like start a phone call. So if you are in a party, I can't talk to people more than two meters from me, probably not even that. But if I look at somebody six meters from me and he looks at me back, or she, and we do it for three or four seconds, then we basically told our devices, we want to, uh, we want to start a phone call, and then a phone call will start. Uh, by the way, I told you that people don't always believe me when I tell them I invent, so I was dancing with somebody. And you stop for a middle uh, f between dances to talk, and she asked me what do you do, and I said, uh, I, I said, uh, I'm an inventor. She said, give me an example of something you invented, and I said, I made an invention on the cabaseo, and she didn't seem to. 
take me very seriously. Now I'm going to uh, give some examples of augmented reality uh, related uh, patterns. And it's related to the stores that will be of, uh, of augmented reality applications. So currently most of you I assume have a smartphone and in the smartphone you can go into uh, a shop, uh, app shop, and then you can buy uh, or, or get for free one of millions of applications. And the assumption is that when you'd have a, a augmented reality glasses, there'll be a, a shop, and you could go into it and get one of a million of applications. And the question is, is this shop the same kind of shop that exists now? So what will be an augmented reality application? So for example, you're looking at the road, you're driving, and one augmented reality application out of many could be one that tells you where to go. So here we have one way to do it. It shows you on the road where it is. But there could be many others. For example, one of them would have a horse running on the road and you're, you're chasing that horse. Or there could be a bird flying, or there could be anything. So you could have this kind of thing, and they show you on the real world what it is that you need to do. Others show you information. Another application will be that you're walking in Spain, and let's assume that you don't know Spanish. So everything that you see is written in the language that you want it to be written. It, you don't even see the Spanish, you just see it in the language that you have. Uh, and this is not futuristic technology, it exists today, as you know. Another one will be for some active application. You want to fix something in the engine, you don't know how to do it, you download the application, and it looks at your hand and tells you what it is that you need to do. So you could say, well, why doesn't it do it itself? Because it's an app. You have your hands, you can do it, and the app tells you what it is that, uh, that you need to do. So um, the problem is that unlike um, unlike uh, applications which are independent, every application that you download doesn't need to know what the others are doing. Here they are not independent. They need to talk to each other. Um, so, so if we talk about the situation, everybody has an AR glasses, or most people like they have uh, um, they have smartphones today, and you have loads of skins that you downloaded, and they might complement each other. They might be doing the same things, and the order is important. And I'll explain in a moment why the order is important. And then, because the order is important and many other considerations, then a skin shop is not the same as an app shop. It's just a different kind of beast. So what kind of issues do you have? The first one is order to apply. So let's assume for simplicity that you have one, one app that changed the cars on the road to elephants. This is what it does. You want to drive and see elephants, not road. And you have another one that sends you to chariots. So the order in which you do them is important. If you do the first one, you see elephant. If you do the second one, you see chariots. And you have 100 apps, and you put a new one, and they ask you, do you want it to, in which place you want to put it? And it's a question that the person will just not know how to reply to. The second problem is that all those apps together have to work in one over 50 of a second, because otherwise you'll have a headache. Let's assume that one of them takes more time. So you can't run all of them because you don't have time to run all of them. You have to choose which of them you're going to run. And all of them you want to run, but you can't run all of them together. Um, you might want to run them efficiently. So if there is an app that changes cats to dogs, it takes a lot of time to look at the image and see if it has cats in it. So maybe the first thing that you do is you see an image and you register all the objects in it, and you actually apply the app only if there is a cat there, otherwise you don't. It asks if there is a cat, it doesn't look for cats. And then you give it the area of the cat and it changes it to dogs. You don't do other things. So you can do it a lot more efficiently if you do it this way. Uh, some of the apps will have bugs in them. So how do, they, how do we debug them? That's my field. So I usually talk about, a lot more about it. And what about can non-programmers write apps? So what about if you want to write an app that change the color of the shirt to yellow? Do you need to be a programmer or just say change the color to the shirt to yellow and I have an app? So, so I thought about this problem, and I'm an inventor. I, I figured out eight patterns that solve and design how an app shop looks like. And it sort of seems strange, because many companies, including yours, put uh, billions of dollars into augmented reality, but they seem to put them into the device and not into how those apps would work. Um, I sold four of them. And when I'm saying I sold four of them, I mean I just described the ideas and how it would work, 
and, and a bit later I will show what it means to have a patent. Uh, so that's three or four pages per idea, and then somebody decide if he wants to buy it, he will make a patent out of it later. So they are not mine, all those patents. So, so the next question is, let's assume that augmented reality exists. And by exist, I mean that it, the augmented reality is so good that you don't know if I'm sitting here and standing here and giving you a lecture. It might be in your glasses. You, don't, you can't tell the difference. So can you, can you drive without it? And the problem is that some of the applications are what's called killer apps. You'll need them. You'll need the, the information. You'll need the, the navigation. So, so you can't drive without it. And the assumption, if enough people have it, the assumption is that other people have it. So there might not be a sign on the road, because that's not nice to the road. The sign will be in your glasses. So, so you need to drive with your glasses on, working. But can you drive with your glasses on, working? Is it safe to drive with the glasses on, working? So you can't drive with it off, but maybe you can't drive with it on as well. And, and what can be the problem? What if the apps are malicious? Some of the apps are against you. So for example, there is an app that what it does, it does all the things it's supposed to do, but it also raises kids in your street. So you're driving and this app, you will not see kids in your street running and you get, you hit them. And, and the way it happened is that somebody created the app and got it to your place and he's attacking your brain, not the computer. So he's showing, the, he's showing there is no kid there. What about if it puts an imaginary kid? You try not to hit him, an accident. What about just a bug? You know, sometimes you probably know that bugs can happen in software. You, you've heard about this concept. Um, what happens if you have an application that what it does, it changed the, change the road to grass. This is what it does. And there's a mistake, there's a pothole in the road and it covered it with grass so you don't see the pothole. Okay, so we have a bad situation where we can't drive with those things on and we can't drive with them off. So what do we do? How do you protect yourself? And, and those questions are really important to me as an inventor. And the reasons are really important to me as an inventor because if I can solve them, then somebody will pay me money. So how do I solve this problem, for example? This come, the solution comes from testing. How do I drive safely on the road um, even though the apps are not well tested. So what I do is I, I use something called the reference model. And I take, uh, I take a driving software like the one your company is doing. And I run it on two different scenarios. One of them is on the world as it is. And the second one is on the world as I see it, as after all the apps. And I see if they drive the same or not drive the same. So for example, let's assume there's an app and what it does is it raises a kid, but the, the kid that it raised is on the sidewalk. It's not related to the way I'm driving. So those two will drive in the same way. There'll be no difference. But if it raises a kid that I'm about to run into, one of them will go straight and the other one will go like that. And, and if they don't agree, I actually prefer to drive in the real world. So if they don't agree with each other, what I will do is I will um, I will just remove all the augmentations and the device protects me by removing all the augmentation if due to the augmentation my driving becomes different. Um, the next one was popular mainly with sports fans. Um, the next patent. So it's a, it's a common phenomenon for mainly the male of our species um, to watch sport on TV and to loudly give instructions to the players. The problem is that the players usually ignore your instructions, which are amazing, and, and you want to have some, some feedback. So what you could do, in theory, is that when you want to give instruction in the game to the player, you split the game into two, and so far I didn't do anything interesting except that I watched the, I have the game twice. But, but what I do next, is that uh, <clears throat> when I want to give an instruction to the player, the one on the right, for example, I will change to a computer game that started exactly the same position as the real game. 
So we have a computer game. It looks sort of like the real game. I mean, Messi is in the same position. The ball is in the same position. The referee, everything is in the same position. But in the computer game, I can start giving instruction to the players because it's a computer game. So I give instructions, and after 30 seconds, the two games don't match with each other, so I continue to watch the real game. And in the end, I can ask um, which Messi is smarter, mine or, or the real one. So when I gave this, uh, when I was being interviewed in Buenos Aires to a paper, um, the title was uh, Shmuel Lourdes, the Israeli scientist who can control the movement of Lionel Messi. I thought it would be a good title for a <laughs> paper. This, this, uh, this patent is again an example of uh, me telling you a story which has nothing to do with the way I invented it. Because I wasn't thinking, I, I'm actually, I don't tell people what to do on TV. Um, and I was trying to think about uh, what can I do with the software that can track things that are moving. Which actually started in the military where they were using it on missiles that were trying to get to the same location as a moving object. Um, usually with uh, somewhat uh, bad results for that object. And now they, they moved it to TV and they moved it to sports and they do all sorts of things and, and I figured out what is it they can do with it. And that's an example of a patent. Now, to make it a patent, you have to make an explanation that somebody from the field could say, I can make it. So to make this thing working, there are a number of stages here and all of them are pretty obvious. You need to split the, the screen into two. That's, that's obvious. You need to know where all the players are. You know that because when one of them leaves the game and you're watching games, they tell you he ran 5.76 kilometers and they were not watching him all the time. Software actually calculates, so they know wherever all the people all the time. And you can also start a game from any position. So this is a description of a pattern, that's enough. And, and this is another pattern uh, that I sold as an idea. Um, another field that is coming is something called deep fake. Um, so, so deepfake is technology which existed before, but now it's, it's sort of commonplace. Everybody can do it. And, and what you can do is uh, you can take the video and the audio of a person and change it. There are many other things that you can do, but we'll discuss the fact that you can take the video of the audio of a person and change it to somebody else. So you take somebody talking and you change it to look like Trump or Obama or somebody did it. And there are three main drives for the, for the technology of deepfake. The first one is like everything else, phonography. You want to change the, you take a film, you want to change the actor or actress to somebody else. The second one is politics. You want to lie about people saying things that they didn't do. And the third one is in, uh, in uh, uh, phone conferences, which are video conferences, where you want to imitate somebody else. And for example, a year and a half ago, somebody called the office, his office. It wasn't the, of course, it was deep fake, so it was cheating. But the manager called the, the secretary and told her that 200,000 euro need to be moved because he's in a meeting now, and she saw the manager talking to her, which seems to be as uh, legitimate as anything that you can talk about. It was his face, his voice. So she followed the instruction and the money got lost. Uh, one problem with deepfake is it destroys trust. Technology, deepfake fighting is difficult. Um, the way you create deepfake is uh, you make a software that can recognize deepfake, and then you use it as a training for your software to make deepfake. It's called coevolution. So whenever you make any software that can recognize deepfake, it doesn't matter how it works, this is actually a way to improve deepfake. Okay? So, so there is an inherent problem <laughs> in creating software that find deepfake because uh, to be able to use it, you have to use it in secret. And of course, if you use it in secret, you can't use it all the time, and, and it's a problem. So people assume that deepfake will become really, really good. It's actually very good by now. And the question is, what can you do about it? Um, so I have a number of ideas. Um, one of them is, for example, that I, I give assignments to the person who's trying to do deepfake. So let's assume that what I'm doing is I, 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 I created the movie, I prepared, worked on it hard, and now I'm, leading, I'm loading it to Facebook saying it's uh, it's live, this is what I'm taking a picture of, this is what is happening now. So what I can do, if I have an agent on the computer, on, on, on the phone, which, which is not trusted, but, but I have an agent that I'm talking to, I'm telling you, I, I don't trust you, I think you may be deepfake, he says, but I'm not lying. This is what I'm saying. So I said, okay, 
I want to see it now in 53.7 uh, frames per second. So if you prepared in advance, now you have to suddenly move your 50 frames per second to 53.5, and that's difficult because you have to do it in real time. I can say, I want you to operate the vibrator of the phone. And of course, it's compensated for it, but, it, but uh, a video of something with a phone vibrating and compensated looks differently than a feel without it. I can say, use the flash, and then I want to see that the things are. So, so I can give him assignments that he has one over 50 of a second to, to do because you have to do it for every frame, and I can check over time. Another thing that I can do is I can have a personal deepfake detector for myself. And then let's assume that I'm talking to my boss. So I have videos of my boss that nobody else has. Nobody, has, nobody else has. So when he talks to me, I can check him against my videos, which is how my boss talks to me. And other people would have a hard time creating uh, something that will, will pass that. So, there are, so it's a really, deep problem, a really big problem. It's going to be a much bigger problem than it is now, but maybe we can delay it a little bit before it, uh, it took now. This problem was anticipated by Heinlein uh, uh, in 1963 when he wrote the book uh, Stranger in a Strange Land. And in it, there was this guy who was paranoid, but for good reasons. So he was a millionaire, and he thought that the government wants to put him in jail. And they did want to put him in jail. And the way he thought they would put him in jail, they would make fake videos. So he was working with witnesses, and they were people who their job was to be fair witnesses, people trained to witness. So we asked him, what does a fair witness say? So he says, well, a witness is trained against hypnosis and all sorts of things, but he also explained what he sees. For example, ask him any question. So we ask him, what's the color of the house? So the witness look at it and he says, well, from this side, it's white. So this is a witness. So to complete, I'm going to talk about two other patterns which are not related to sight. One of them is related to sound. A big problem with sound is that people who are becoming above 65 have a hard time hearing when, the no when it's a noisy environment. They, they just can't hear what is being said. And the, the problem is that they not, don't hear well, is that they can't separate well. So the patent here is that I use Shazam. And then I, anything that I recognize, if I can recognize the music, for example, I'm in a restaurant, then I can use active noise cancellation and remove it. So any music that I find in the area, I recognize it. Think about it being in a wedding and being able to remove all the music that comes from the loudspeaker. And then you can talk. So this is uh, an example of something that's related to, uh, uh, to sound. And the last example is something related to scent. Um, what I invented, and I don't have the time to, to discuss it in detail, is a way to make a scent which is personal. So with video, you can do something personal. For example, there are apps now where the makeup is in the video conference. It's not on your face. And the advantage of that is that you can do different makeup for every person you talk to immediately. You can do the same thing with smell. And then you can have a, a different uh, scent for every person that you talk to, depending on who the person is, if it's the boyfriend, if it's work, if it's something else. So you can choose replace uh, smells. And in a, rest, in a store, you could have different scent, depending on whether you expect the person to buy a cake or a tent. Um, so I hope this was interesting, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you might have. So actually, I have two questions. The first is, can you elaborate about, you said that you made a mistake, but not protecting the invisible printing. So can you elaborate? And the second is more open-ended. It seems uh, to many, to me and to many others in the software industry that uh, software patterns have, uh, let's say, there are two ed two-edged swords, and they also inhibit in innovation instead of promoting. Can you talk more about it? For sure. So. Um So to answer the first one, I will not answer it directly, but <clears throat> I will reply as to why most people who write patents don't know how to do it. So most of the patents that are written, more than 80% of them cannot be used even if somebody infringes you. And the reason is the following. So all of you people here, I assume, are doing our, our programming. 
And let's assume that you have never, you never execute your programs. You just check that the compiler passes them. What is the likelihood that your program would work? It's not, right? So a patent lawyer, that, uh, a patent attorney is the one that you go to to write your patent. What he knows is how to get the patent granted, which means he knows how to pass through a single person working for a single day who earns $70,000 a year, who has 10 hours to try to check why not to give you a patent. Once the patent is granted, if you want to use it, you'll have to go to court. And that's $4 million per, per side, and, and, and the lawyers on the other side are really good. So it turns out that it's really relatively easy to write patents which get granted but cannot be used in court. And there are many, many ways to make mistakes, and I, I will not go into it because it's, it's a bit technical. I'll be happy to answer all the large. It's much harder to write a patent that is useful than to write a patent which is not useful. About software patents. So, so the idea of the patent system is that I get 20 years of, uh, of exclusivity for telling you something that, that was useful to you. Many of the software patents are not useful to you in the sense that you also invented them yourself. You didn't use my invention. In which case, the theory says that I shouldn't have gotten the patent on it to begin with. But let's take the patents that I showed on how to do remote examination. I showed an idea by which I can test you at home and see that you are the ones that are doing it. I think this is a useful idea in the sense that if somebody wants to use it, he learned for me how to do it, and then I should get paid. So it's not really related to the question of software or not. It's related to the question of was the invention something that you can be proud of, something that is, is, is interesting. And that's related to the patent office. So when I make patents, I try to make patents which I can stand behind, which I can say those are patents that have been useful. Um, and indeed, it's, it's very common that there are patents which, uh, which are created, uh, easily created for fighting against other people. And um, one of the suggestions to how to fix the system was that the patent will not work against you if you can show that you didn't know about it and you independently invented the patents. Uh, but it's not specific to software. It's not only to software. The issue is economic. In, 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 uh, in the chemical industry, they will just not be able to work without patents. Um, so, so the economics are such that in software, you want to possibly make it a bigger uh, inventing step necessary. But, but it's hard to argue about what is obvious or not in retrospect. You said that um, uh, there are companies like startups who uh, pay you to um, invent something for them. So. Is it like, I guess it's not for uh, invent something to fix this given problem, but rather invent something so that we can uh, expand on? Is this the case? What's the economics here? Of, right. of your, so, so it seems like a really strange idea that people have a startup, they know what they are doing. Why, they invent me? Why do they invite me to invent? So sometimes they want me to improve whatever it is that they are doing. Um, so uh, a startup asks me to invent new ways to talk on the phone. Okay, so, so I do that. Sometimes they ask me to invent, startups are really focused on the near present, but they are evaluated according to the story that they tell. So what they will do in the future if the, 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 real, the near present would actually work. So if I invent for them a new market and a new story to tell, and this story is not, not only a patent, but something they actually tell the investors, not as a patent, but as a story, then I did something useful for them. So all those things exist. Thank you so much for coming to us.